There are many scholars today who believe the most ancient biblical authors were polytheistic, and only later did monotheism slowly evolve out of this ancient setting. Then later editors rewrote their past and fabricated the idea that their ancestors were always monotheistic. However, the biblical text contains several anomalies that don't seem to fit with an evolution from polytheism and fit far more with a sudden and ancient monotheistic revolution. One of the most difficult problems for scholars to uncover is where did the divine name of Yahweh come from? It seems to have come out of the blue and doesn't fit with early mythologies. Minder Dijkstra notes, It is a puzzle that the name and character of Yahweh appears out of the blue in the ancient Near East, in contrast to deities such as El and Baal and goddesses such as Asherah and Astarte. The name of Yahweh is still lacking in the list of gods, in myths and other kinds of religious records of the ancient Near East before Iron One. This is interesting as it relates to debate over two views on the origins of biblical monotheism. Some believe biblical monotheism must have evolved from an earlier polytheistic and henotheistic outlook. Yahweh was originally part of a pantheon that was later edited out of the Bible. So this would be evolutionary monotheism. However, there is another type of monotheism called revolutionary monotheism. Jan Osman says, Whereas evolutionary monotheism may be seen as the final stage of polytheism, there is no evolutionary line leading from polytheism to revolutionary monotheism. This form of monotheism manifests itself in the first place as a negative or counter-religion defining what God is not and how God should not be worshipped. This doesn't mean revolutionary monotheism is necessarily bringing about a brand new religion. It could also be a revival, like an attempt to return to the ancient beliefs of your ancestors, and still be revolutionary for the current time period it is taking place in. Revolutionary monotheism would be what we would expect if the biblical account is a true depiction of the past, where the high god, who is known as El Elyon, reveals himself by the name of Yahweh to individuals in different generations and calls for certain people to only worship and follow him. So the question we need to ask is, does the internal and limited external evidence favor evolutionary monotheism or revolutionary monotheism? The evidence seems to show there are too many anomalies that do not fit well with the evolutionary theory, and revolutionary monotheism fits far better with the data. To start, as we already noted, the name of Yahweh seems to appear suddenly and without signs of evolution. There are various theories of where the divine name came from, but the one that makes the most sense is it derives from the phrase in Exodus 3, I will be that I will be. Trigve Medinger notes the name Yahweh fits well with a third-person form of this phrase, meaning to utter Yahweh means He is. Since no mortal human could say the divine phrase about himself, one refers to God in third person as Yahweh, or He is. Over time I became convinced by Medinger's arguments over other alternative views. This seems to be the most sufficient origin to the name of Yahweh, given this is what is indicated in the text itself. The name Yahweh is understood as a form of the verb, Haya, to be. However, verbal form names for deities are exceptionally rare and seem to be unique to only Yahweh within Canaanite religions. Also, the name seems to imply a timeless nature and a special status that no other being could possibly possess, unlike how other deities from that time were viewed. This would make sense with the lack of a theogony in the biblical text for Yahweh the birth story of a god's beginning. Whereas most other gods have a beginning point, the origins of Yahweh is absent from the text. So I would suggest the name Yahweh seems to fit better with a revolutionary model, not an evolution from a simpler deity in a pantheon. The name Yahweh, although predating Moses and the nation of Israel, 
shows no evidence it derives from typical Canaanite deity naming schemes or common Canaanite beliefs about deities. Now the name is probably related to earlier Arabic languages and probably predates Moses. But the data on this is so limited and hard to nail down a definite connection. The best explanation is still the phrase in Exodus 3, that the name Yahweh is related to the phrase, I will be that I will be, and implies some sort of unique existence. There are also indications from external evidence. Israel was more focused on Yahweh in its earlier stages, and pagan worship was brought in as an addition to Israel's devotion to Yahweh. Marjo Corpel notes several odd silences from data outside of the Bible on early Israelite religion. Now, arguments from silence can be used with caution. If there was a good reason an author should have mentioned something and didn't, then an argument from silence may be used as a valid inference, and there are key pieces of data that should have included evidence of early polytheism. To start, in the early Mesha Stile, the king of Moab explicitly mentions the god and goddess of his own nation, but then in speaking about Israel, he only mentions their god Yahweh. If the goddess Asherah or any other god had a prominent role in early Israel, we should have expected to see them mentioned. Combined with that, Richard Hess knows most of the personal names in Israel from that time period are either El or Yahweh names, and there is very little evidence of people being named after other deities. In contrast to the nation of Ammon, we see what resembles more of a mix with names referencing various deities. Dykstra also notes the belief that Yahweh brought Israel up out of Egypt was believed to be an old tradition, and this tradition seems to lack the mention of other deities, which would make sense if Israel began with monotheistic ideas and pagan deities were only added in later. Benjamin Sommer draws attention to seals found throughout ancient Canaan. More than 8,500 stamp seals have been found in the region. Non-Israelite seals contain a wide variety of deities, whereas Israelite seals typically only portray one deity. Plus, they rarely provide a picture of the deity and instead represent him symbolically as a sun disk. In fact, anthropomorphic representation of deities became vastly less common in the highlands of ancient Israel. Each of these points individually wouldn't amount to much, but combined, it seems to favor the idea Israel originally was more monotheistic and paganism was synchronized in later, instead of Israel originally being polytheistic and evolving the monotheism. Now once again, as we said in our last video, there is no doubt there was rampant polytheism in Israel during this time period. J.S. Holliday found that in certain villages, about 45% of all households had some type of cultic idol. But this is still less than half and would make more sense if polytheism was attempting to infiltrate Israel instead of it being there originally. The cultic images began at a local level, which the Bible talks about, whereas the official religion of Israel was still devotion to Yahweh. We should expect far more incorporated and rampant polytheism if it was there originally. Thus, this data not only matches the biblical account, but seems to fit far better with early revolutionary monotheism. The biblical authors also did things that wouldn't have made sense if they were originally polytheistic. Polytheists in Egypt, Greece, Rome, Babylon, Assyria tended to synchronize their deities with those of other cultures. When Assyrian beliefs mixed with Babylonian beliefs, their god Asher was equated with Marduk. If the biblical authors were originally polytheistic, it would make sense for them to do the same thing with Yahweh. But instead, they proclaim Yahweh as Lord over all the nations and above all gods, while living under Babylonian rule. This was quite a dangerous thing to do for a conquered nation and it would look rather foolish to the surrounding cultures. Why not just go with the cultural norm and say Yahweh was Marduk if they were originally more polytheistic? But it does fit if they already viewed themselves as monolatrists with implicit monotheism and had an ancient covenant with a unique God who was already seen as the Most High. Christine Hayes 
notes the anomaly of Israelite monotheism arising, as it doesn't seem to fit with the cultural world of that day. Conquest and exile were events that normally would spell the end of a particular ethnic national group, particularly in antiquity. Conquered peoples would trade their defeated god for the victorious god of their conquerors, and eventually there would be uh, cultural and religious uh, assimilation, intermarriage, that people would disappear as a distinctive entity. And in fact, that is what happened to the ten tribes of the northern kingdom to a large degree. They were lost to history. This did not happen to those members of the nation of Israel who lived in the southern kingdom, Judah. Despite the demise of their uh, national political base in 586, the Israelites alone, really, among the many peoples who have uh, figured in ancient Near Eastern history, the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Babylonians, the Hittites, the Phoenicians, the Hurrians, the Canaanites, they emerged after the death of their state, producing a community and a culture that can be traced through various twists and turns and vicissitudes of history right down into the modern period. That's a pretty unique claim. And they carried with them the idea and the traditions that laid the foundation for the major religions of the Western world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Next, much to our surprise, there is no Hebrew word for a female deity. Yehezkel Kaufman once said, the Hebrew of the Bible possesses no word to designate a feminine deity. It has no Elah, Elia, or Eloha. I thought this had to be false when I first read it, but nevertheless it turns out to be true. The ancient Hebraic language contains no words for a generic female deity. And there are places they could have used the word when referencing Asherah. And there was a word for goddess in Ugritic texts, one of Israel's closest cultural parallels. However, the lack of the word would make sense if the original Hebraic writings lacked a pantheon that was only added in later through rebellion. If you only had one genderless deity, there is no need for such a word. If monotheism evolved from polytheism, there should have been a remnant word that could indicate a female goddess. Yet this cannot be demonstrated within the Hebrew scriptures. We need to remember languages tend to be more conservative than the culture. As Roland de Vaux says, language is more conservative than custom, and Hebrew retains several traces of that semi-nomadic life of years gone by. For example, generations after the conquest, a house was called a tent, and not only in poetry, where it is frequent, but also in everyday speech. Disbanded soldiers return every man to his own tent Again, to express leaving early in the morning, a verb is often used which means to load the beasts of burden. Nomads use the word to say striking camp at dawn. So the lack of a word for goddess doesn't seem to fit with evolutionary monotheism, but fits far more with the biblical account of Israel, starting out as monotheistic and then becoming more polytheistic once they settled in Canaan and began to mix with the surrounding pagan cultures. On top of this, Edward Sermon has argued pastoral and nomadic cultures from Africa and America lean more towards monotheism, as it is more pragmatic. Multiple gods require a culture that has settled down in cities, so more attention can be paid to the gods. It is much harder to attend to holy tents or mobile shrines of multiple gods when you have to keep moving things around. More primitive and nomadic cultures in Africa, like the Messiah Kikuyu, are far more monotheistic in their approach. Likewise, given Israel was originally nomadic according to its own origins, it makes more sense for monotheism to have been there originally and later degrade into polytheism when they settled in Canaan. Also, unlike the surrounding pagan nations, Yahweh is not imminently manifested in nature. In Egypt, the sun was the manifestation of a god, as other elements of nature were as well. But this doesn't seem to be the case in the Hebrew Bible. H.C. Brichto says, Biblical religion not only removes the one God from the domain of mythology, but as often noted, it demythologizes creation itself. And this is even wild echoes with the constructs of pagan mythology. Trigve Medinger says, 
In the Old Testament, God's proximity to the world is never such that one could speak of his imminence in the narrow sense. God does not dwell in the sun, the stars, the rain, or the wind. Not even passages that expressly speak of God dwelling in the temple on Zion describe an unsophisticated or undifferentiated concept of imminence. On the contrary, the Old Testament emphasizes God's exaltion above worldly matters, transcendence. For the biblical authors, nature was impersonal. There is only one God above all who controls everything, but he is not manifested in nature, unlike what the surrounding polytheistic nations believed about their gods. At times, biblical authors used analogies or metaphors to praise God, but they never explicitly describe him as nature or a part of nature. So as Mark Chavales says, for Israel, Yahweh was the end all to reality. It stemmed from him as a transcendent being. In Mesopotamia, as in Canaan, there was a multiplicity of powers, all stemming from and dependent upon an external reality. Also, despite the way it appears on the surface, God is displayed as beyond genders in the biblical texts. Menninger notes Yahweh is described oftentimes in feminine ways, as caring for a suckling child, having a womb, crying like a woman in labor, having birth pains, being the proper replacement for female deities, and woman is also his image. When God is described as father, the text implies that is more about the role Yahweh plays than ascribing gender, as is when God is described in feminine ways. Thus, Menager concludes, Yahweh was unique among other deities as being genderless. The logical implication of this would seem to be that Yahweh was conceived as standing above genders of the created world, that is, that God was held to be asexual. Next, pagan deities needed to be cared for. Within polytheistic religions, humans depended on the gods and the gods depended on humans. Humans would feed and care for the gods and the gods would protect humans. Jean Botero records how the gods were provided meals throughout the day and given perfumes and special gifts. And in return, the gods would keep order, provide protection, and return favors. And this would have made paganism more attractive. If you can buy a god with gifts containing something they need, you can trade that for selfish rewards, which would explain why Israel was eager to worship them. But the biblical religion is clear that God needs nothing of humans, which is why you can't buy Yahweh off, and this can make the biblical religion less appealing to the ancient mind. What was more valuable than a god you could trade with? Moving away from a mutual relationship within polytheism doesn't seem pragmatic if you want your religion to compete and survive. Why make Yahweh inaccessible on your level when that wasn't the cultural norm? It's also clear, as Yehezkel Kaufman pointed out, that Yahweh lacked a mythology on how he became the supreme deity. Surrounding cultures typically had a story of how their high deity took control of the pantheon and became the head god. Great examples are Marduk, Baal, and Zeus. Benjamin Sommer notes this often came about after a great battle with other deities. However, this is oddly lacking in the biblical texts. In places like Psalm 29 and Isaiah 6, other lesser divine beings exist only to praise God, not to battle him or elect him to the position. In Genesis 1.26, the divine council is only informed and not consulted when electing man as the image of God. There are some texts that do refer to Yahweh battling against his enemies, similar to how other pagan deities battled so they could ascend to be the Most High. But Sommer says, The biblical texts differ from the Ugritic parallels, however in crucial respects. They describe the doomed revolt against a deity who was already in charge, a revolt Yahweh puts down without any difficulty. These passages lack any real drama, for they convey no sense that Yahweh was required to engage in real exertion to suppress the insurrection. Baal and Marduk, Zeus and Cronus toiled to attain an exalted status. Yahweh had that status to begin with and retains it with ease. In other words, Yahweh is just assumed to be all-powerful, 
There is no story on how he ascended to be the Most High, no story of how he came into existence, and the world never exists without him. He is simply unique as is, and never seems to change from one state to a more exalted state. Also, Israel's God is distinct in being a jealous God over worship of other gods. John Walton says, The gods would not be jealous of attention paid to other gods as long as their needs were being met and their position was not in jeopardy. Again, in this way, the God of Israel was very different from any other deity, and the Israelites had quite a bit of trouble adjusting their thinking to the idea that Yahweh would not tolerate the open-ended system. In the ancient world, you could typically affirm allegiance to a god, but then also worship other gods, especially if they covered a different realm of inquiry. The concept of a god being jealous over loyalty or worship is pretty rare. Now, as we noted in the last video, there were monolatrous tendencies within other cultures, but the idea of these other gods being jealous was not inherent in their reasons to become monolatrist. Yahweh seems to be distinct in jealousy over people worshiping other gods. Medinger says, Yahweh's violent jealousy, which tolerates no rival, is without parallel in the religious literature of the ancient Near East. Another peculiar distinction is how ethics changed in the biblical worldview. We find no evidence in polytheistic cultures they considered their gods to be the foundation of morality, or faithful, or loving towards humanity. They may have displayed these characteristics at times, but they were not essential or immutable qualities. The character of the gods could change randomly, much in the same way people can change. Whereas Yahweh was seen as eternally good, thereby making it impossible for him to do evil or be unjust. But the idea of morality was also different in the biblical worldview. First, various texts in the ancient world speak of people wishing they could decipher the will of the gods. For example, I wish I knew that these things were pleasing to one's god. What is proper to oneself is an offense to one's god. What in one's own heart seems despicable is proper to one's god. Who knows the will of the gods in heaven? Who understands the plans of the underworld gods? Where have mortals learnt the way of God? Jean Patero cites another interesting text. O oh gods Ea, Shamash, and Marduk, what sins have I committed for such a curse, such misfortune to have befallen? My God, your punishment is a heavy burden, and yet I know not the reason. What must I have done, O oh God, and what must I have committed, to find myself like river water, flowing I know not where, like a boat not knowing where I will land? Understanding what the gods wanted was a difficult task that could rarely be known, as it could change on a whim. Patero even notes there is no lack of names that meant, what sin have I committed, or what have I done against my god? However, Yahweh's will was made clear in expressing a good moral character and devotion to him above all else. Thus in Israel, the obligations of God were made known and were not built on the whims of a deity who could change their laws when their emotions changed. In the polytheistic cultures, such ideas were not known and the will of the gods was random and distant. J.J. Finkelstein and Jean Patero have argued the biblical idea of morality was revolutionary to how the ancient world viewed right and wrong. Since the laws of the Torah introduced personal guilt, integrity, and located morality in the character of God himself, Right and wrong was not a new idea in the ancient world, but right and wrong was redirected in the Pentateuch. Order was the highest good, and disorder was the worst of evils in the ancient world. So for the ancient mindset, it was more sinful for a prostitute to leave her temple and find a better life than just remain a prostitute, because such an act would break the order and her placement in society. This idea has turned on its head in the Pentateuch, Prostitution is immoral as an act in and of itself, and it is better to break the order of things than to do something immoral. So as Carol Vandertorn says, The Babylonians did not have an introspective tradition, and had little sense of interiority 
subjectivity had not been invented yet. The virtual absence of interiority and subjectivity in the Babylonian autobiographical tradition follows from the concept of a person as a social role and character. Individual identity, in this view, is not what you are deep down, but what you manifest to be. It is public and social. Jean Patero says, Did morality, honest and righteous behavior, have an authentic religious and cultural value, a place in the practice of religion, a direct influence on the gods? We have never found any response in all of our documentation to such a question. A question that we ask ourselves from our own religious and biblical point of view. The ancient Mesopotamians never overtly concerned themselves with or imagined such preoccupations, which are so familiar to us. This must have been one of Moses' great revolutions in Israel, to replace the purely material maintenance of the gods with the single and sole liturgical obligation in life to obey a moral law, thereby truly rendering to God the only homage worthy of him. Thus the Torah radically changed the way right and wrong were viewed by introducing moral laws as primary, not keeping and establishing order in society, regardless of how it affected the individual. With this, the idea of personal guilt and integrity came in. Van der Torn notes, because of how the ancient world viewed morality, their focus was on honor and shame. You did good to receive public honor, and you did not do what was bad, so you did not receive public shame. Thus, good and evil were public ideas, not personal ideas. So if you committed adultery, and neither you or the participant told anyone, there was no sin committed, since it brought no public shame. But in the Torah, something is still wrong even if no one sees it, or it doesn't affect the community. Sin is thus moved to a personal level between you and God, not between you and the community. John Walton says, The knowledge of the Torah created a far different situation concerning their awareness of offense and the ability to confess it. The ability to identify offense and the sense of having done wrong provide a fertile environment for guilt to emerge at a different level. Christine Hayes notes the phrase that appears frequently in the Pentateuch, I am the Lord your God was placed there on purpose to teach integrity, as it is often paired with moral commands. The idea was God was always watching, so you ought to do good regardless of anyone sees because you are beholden to God first. The scope of the law is holistic. It's going to contain social and ethical and moral and religious prescriptions, and very often they're going to be couched in an authoritative, apodictic style, particularly the things that aren't enforceable in a court of law. They will be, tend to be the ones that are backed up by the authority of God directly. You shall do this, I, the Lord, am your God. Notice how many times that, that refrain is used, and it's almost always used with those unenforceable kinds of things. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, I, the Lord, am your God. It's me who's watching out for this one, not the court, okay? Thus, the Pentateuch radically changed how ancient people viewed morality. And this would also explain why many Israelites preferred to worship other gods instead. They were not omniscient, so they couldn't see everything, and they didn't advocate morality in a biblical sense, thus making it easier to do as one pleased. The biblical view breaks from this worldview, and it would seem odd to have developed out of such polytheistic cultures with their way of thinking. Another odd feature is where the biblical religion of Yahweh claims that it came from. The Bible claims it began as a family religion of Abraham and over time became a tribal religion and then a national religion of Israel. This seems to be the only known example of this type of development. State gods did become family gods or specific tribal gods, but we don't see other examples of a god only associated with a family becoming a national god. Yahweh is distinct in this. And this is an odd origin story. If you want to claim your nation had a right to the land in Canaan, why invent a story that your forefather was a foreigner with an unheard of name of the Most High God El Elyon? This would be like a group of Hindus claiming Krishna gave them Texas, but it was okay because they identified Krishna with Jesus. This is not the best way to go about claiming the land was yours over the people who had already lived there before Abraham.
On top of this, the Pentateuch obligates one to worship the state god and the state god only. Other nations had state gods, but people were not obligated to worship such a deity and only that deity. The common people could worship the state god and their ancestral deities or any deities for that matter. This is why it could appear that Israel was committed to Yahweh alone, but the people believed they could worship other gods as they pleased. They were perceived as still devoted to Yahweh and being an Israelite, but could still consult other deities for other matters. Jeroboam I could credit his victory in obtaining the northern kingdom of Israel to Yahweh and still worship other deities for other matters after the fact. The ancient mindset didn't consider this to be a contradiction. But the biblical writers were distinct from the surrounding nations in demanding they only could be devoted to Yahweh and only worship Him. And they based this on their ancient covenant they claimed they had, thus setting themselves up as a unique people among the other nations. Of course, the use of the Sabbath also fits better with the revolutionary theory, as there is nothing like it in the ancient Near East. The Sabbath was the sign of the Mosaic Covenant. It was to be performed publicly to show one was in covenant with Yahweh. And there is no evidence of this practice evolving from an earlier precursor. So the Sabbath fits better with a revolutionary covenant introduced early in Israel's history. Next, we cannot forget the explicit commandment of no graven images. This is not the outlawing of basic iconography or art. A graven image was how a deity manifested its presence in the material realm, so humans could care for him, and it was how humans gained access to the presence of a deity. In Egypt, court cases were brought before Amun, where he would give answers as manipulated by the priests. In other words, humans could care for the needs of the gods, and the gods would grant rewards or access to them in return. The biblical worldview rejects that the presence of Yahweh can be contained to such an image or controlled by humans. God was not obligated to manifest in a graven image and provide answers when humans demanded it. Trigvay Medinger notes, this differs radically from the surrounding peoples. And this idea would make sense with revolutionary monotheism, but would seem an odd way to evolve if the evolutionary theory is true. Now, here's the main issue. You could say later biblical authors scrubbed the text clean of any mention of these things we went over, which is possible, but improbable given the amount of things they would have had to remove or change and not leave any resemblance behind. It seems far more likely from internal evidence and the very limited external evidence we have available that the biblical religion represents revolutionary monotheism and struggles to fit with the idea of evolutionary monotheism so it's more similar to Akhenaten's revolutionary monotheism. Akhenaten's monotheism is an example of a revolution that was attempted but failed. The biblical religion should be understood as a revolution that was fought against but ultimately prevailed. This seems to make far more sense with the data. And so, as Alan Millard notes, a unique phenomenon is awkward for historians, since they have no standard way to explain or assess it so they make strenuous attempts to fit it with a pattern of known features in the same general category. In other words, attempts are made to try and force the biblical religion into an evolutionary mold, but this is simply strenuous and should be rejected. Now before we wrap up, we are not denying the obvious fact that Israel was still an ancient Near Eastern culture. They were not completely independent from the surrounding cultures, and we can find obvious parallels within the biblical text to surrounding practices and beliefs. But even though Israel was a part of the ancient world, they were also unique within the ancient world. There was something different about the biblical worldview that stood out and managed to stand the test of time that cannot be explained by simply stating this evolved from a polytheistic background. The biblical religion is best explained as a revolutionary idea that was working within the ancient Near Eastern mindset, which is why there are similarities, but the differences cannot be ignored. It makes far more sense with the theory a new idea was introduced into the ancient world suddenly and revolutionary in its thinking.